Okay, so we are now live. Okay, welcome back guys to another shadowing session. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Catherine Ding here uh, from UCLA Orthodontics. And she's going to be talking to us about a little bit about her uh, pre-dental dental journey, as well as wa uh, walk us through some cases that she's done. Okay. All right. So uh, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, as she said, thank you for the introduction. My name is Dr. Catherine Ding. I am a second year ortho resident at UCLA. And so, yeah, so today I'm just going to be kind of talking about my journey um, my story about how I got into dentistry and also um, introduce you guys to orthodontics in, in particular, since that's what I do. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation. So, okay. All right, so we'll just get into it. Again, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit, an, a little introduction from myself here. So um, I was born in Reno, Nevada, um, kind of moved around a lot when I was a kid and I moved back to China when I was five years old. Um, I lived mainly in Nanjing and in Shanghai and went to international school. And then for college, I came back to the United States. I went to Northwestern University. I was actually an economics major. And so I didn't really choose dentistry until halfway through college, which I'll kind of elaborate a little bit in a second. And then after college, I came to UCLA for dental school for four years and stayed here at UCLA for my orthodontic residency, which is three years. So I'll be graduating next year. Um, as I said before, I wasn't originally interested in dentistry. I went into college wanting to do finance or investment banking, and I really didn't really know what I wanted to do at the time. And uh, banking and finance was seemed to be really popular, and I liked I was fine with math at the time. So, and everyone knows that you know banking you make a good amount of money. So I was like, why not? And so that's why I was an economics major, but halfway through college, after getting to know more about the industry and talking to more people in finance, I realized that's not really what I wanted to do. I felt like I wasn't directly creating a value that, I, that mattered to me. So then I switched to pre-dental pre in the beginning of my junior year in college. So my last two years of college were a little bit harder than most people's. I was taking the, all the intro science classes like biology, physics, organic chemistry, all of that with the sophomores and freshmen at the time. Um, but it was definitely really worth it. And then I also took a gap year in order to apply for dental school and finish up any required classes to get into dental school. And another tidbit is that I worked as a dental assistant during my time um, in college for those last two years. And that really helped me kind of see what dentistry was all about. And I originally actually wanted to just shadow, but I was very lucky that this dentist actually decided to hire me in order to work for her. And so I was getting paid to learn about dentistry, which is really cool. Um, a little bit about why I chose dentistry in particular. So dentistry is one of those rare industries where it's a really great combination between art and science, which is usually two things that you don't really put together. But to be a dentist, you need to actually be quite artistic. Um, you have you to have a good uh, eye for detail. We work in like very minuscule scale. We're working in millimeter increments, so everything's very meticulous. You have to really uh, be detail oriented, be very patient, um, and there's a, like I said, a decent amount of art artistry to it. So I really like drawing. I really like art, and I also really enjoy learning about science. So that was a really good combination for me. Another thing is building relationships with your patients. So if you're doing, um, you're, if you're a general dentist or orthodontist like I am, you see your patient over their lifetime. You build a long-term relationship with them. So it's really nice to have that connection and um, many of them become your friends. So uh, it's really special. And 
you also work reasonable hours and have a decent lifestyle as opposed to something like being a medical doctor. You're not ever dealing with life and death situations um, and it's a good work-life balance. And specifically for me, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to do orthodontics right when I was applying for dental school. Uh, so I knew I wanted to do braces and things like that. <clears throat> And for orthodontics, what attracted me was that you work mostly with adolescents. You work with a great age group. So you're, you're seeing them when they are, you know, preteens and you work with them like ortho treatment, braces treatment takes like two to three years. So you, you watch these kids grow up, you make a real difference in their lives. And so it's really special and uh, you get to see tangible results because you can actually see the teeth move and physically see your work come to fruition. And another thing is most people don't realize this, but for orthodontics, we're not just dealing with teeth. We're actually treating the face as well. The position of your teeth really affects someone's face, like the, especially the position of your front teeth. It affects how full your lips are, like it affects your profile, affects your uh, affects your smile. So um, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's really cool because you're just, you're treating the whole person. You're not treating, just treating teeth. And the last one is obviously giving patients confidence, which is always really, really great. And seeing them take their braces off. It's like, it's a really great feeling. Um, so what is orthodontics, you know, in general, if for those of you who don't no, um, ortho means straight, dontic means anything to do with teeth. So it just pretty much is straightening teeth, but the official definition of orthodontics is um, a branch of dentistry that's dealing with irregularities of the teeth or alignment and the occlusion, so your bite, and also the jaws. And uh, we do that mainly with braces, of course. Now there are more and more aligners, clear aligners like Invisalign. Um, so that's becoming more and more popular and that's definitely something that we also do. But sometimes Invisalign, it's limited in what it can do and the certain different uh, tooth movements that it can achieve. So we still mainly work with braces. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, what do we do, you know, when a patient first comes in into the office? So first of all, we would, we would have a consultation with them and, you know, collect all the records so that we can give a proper diagnosis. So when a patient comes in, first we would jot down their medical and dental history and note down their chief complaint. So that's the reason or their main concern that brought you to the office brought them to the office. And then we'll take photos both in the mouth intraorally and also uh, extraorally, which is like the face so that we can really get a big picture of everything. We take radiographs, which is x-rays. Usually we would take a side view, a lateral step. So a side view right here to see where the jaws are in relation to each other. We would also take a panoramic, which is this middle one here. Basically, uh, you go around the face and you get a big picture of the jaws and, the, and the, all the teeth and the roots and everything. And the last thing we do is take models of the teeth so that we can study them when the patient isn't there. So once we get all those records, we we like we look at them, we study them, we look at them in three like three categories. So first of all, we look the face and the soft tissue. So basically, like I mentioned before, ortho like your position of your teeth affects can your face shape and like the side view of your face. So we assess that some people are more convex, which means their upper lip area is more protrusive. It's more convex. Um, some people are straight. Some people are the opposite, where it's concave. That's usually what we call, you know, the lay term for it is like an underbite when your chin is protrusive like this. We also look at the smile, you know, how much uh, of the teeth the patient shows when they smile. Generally, the more they show the, the younger you look. So we don't want to bury their teeth in, in their, under their lip. Some people also have a gummy smile, which we have to kind of take into consideration. The next thing we look at is the skeleton or skeletally where the upper and lower jaws are in relation to each other. So sometimes the upper jaw can be too forward compared to the lower jaw. We call that like a class two 
occlusion. Um, and then the opposite of that would be a class three occlusion. So this, this would be like an underbite where the lower jaw is too far forward. So we look at that. Then last but not least, we look at the teeth itself. So obviously we look at how crowded they are. So like, you know, how squished they are with each other, if there's any spacing. Um, and then another thing we, we look at is crossbite. So normally we would wanna see the upper teeth should be a little bit outside of the lower teeth. Like if you look at this bottom photo on the right side, this is like an ideal situation where the top teeth are a little bit more on the outside of the bottom teeth. But on this left side, you see that it's the opposite. And this is what it's called a crossbite. And um, we wanna fix this because it can affect the patient's like function. So it's hard for them to chew. Sometimes it can affect their speech as well. <clears throat> and some typical you know, procedures that we do day to day in the office. The first one being banding and bonding braces. So what that means is, well, banding is, um, I, some of you may not may know this, but in the back teeth, when we put braces on, we, we usually put a band on, like a, like a ring on the tooth. And this is to help hold the wire in place in the back when we put the braces on. So we band the molar teeth, and then bonding is just a fancy word for saying, uh, sticking the the brackets on the teeth, these individual little metal brackets. This is actually a very meticulous process um, because your the position of the bracket determines where the teeth will be and how angulated they will be. So if you're a hair off with the bracket placement, then your whole root's gonna like move in an undesirable way. So it's really, it's pretty, uh, it's just very meticulous and very precise. And the next thing that we do, kind of the bread and butter of orthodontics is changing or adjusting the arch wire. So the way braces works is that we have these wires that are shaped in the U, like a, what a normal arch form would look like. And we put that wire, it's generally pretty soft in the beginning. We put that wire and engage it in all the brackets, like in this bottom picture with all the crowded teeth put it in there and then over time, this wire is gonna wanna go back to its original shape and that will pull the teeth in that, towards that direction. And then over time, it'll end up like this top picture here. Um, but it's not quite so simple like that. You know, we have to actually keep changing the wires depending on what movement we want. So uh, we start with softer wires to be able to fit them all into the brackets if the teeth are really squished together, like in the bottom picture. And then slowly over uh, months, we would change it to stiffer and stiffer wires. And so that's generally how braces works. Another thing we do is uh, we use appliances. So appliances are just other types of instruments, other, other types of methods that we use on top of braces to help us achieve our goals. There's many, many, many different types of orthodontic appliances. I've included two of the big ones that you might have heard of before. Um, on the left hand side, we have the headgear. So the headgear is uh, it attaches to the back teeth of, of your upper teeth. And then there's a wire, a metal rod that comes out of the mouth and connects to a strap that either goes under the base of the neck right here, or it can hug the top of your head, depending on what kind of movement we want. And this is to help us, uh, most of the time is to help us control the growth of the upper jaw. Like if a kid has their upper jaws too forward, we wanna use that to pull that upper jaw back and make sure it doesn't move forward. And on the right side, we have an expander. So some people might have a very narrow upper jaw and we would use this kind of appliance to push the sides of the upper jaw out to widen it. And as you can see in the middle here, there's kind of a screw. There's a little hole right in the middle. It's like a keyhole. And then the patient would actually use a special rod um, and kind of use that keyhole to turn the screw uh, like twice a day or like depending on what's needed, they turn it themselves at home. And then slowly it'll expand the appliance and widen the um, upper arch. 
Um, we also play a big role in orthognathic, orthognathic surgery or jaw surgery. When a patient needs jaw surgery, uh, the orthodontist is the one in charge of preparing the teeth in their ideal position, preparing them to for the surgery. And then after the patient gets the surgery, so they get the surgery with the braces on. And then after they get the surgery, they'll stay in braces for about six more months um, for the orthodontist to finish up, do a little bit of detailing and make sure the bite is perfect. We typically want to see, we want to do jaw surgery um, when like the patient has a very di big discrepancy between upper and lower jaws. So like this girl in this picture, her lower jaw is like too forward. She, she probably has an underbite. And the only way to fix that is to do surgery, to set the lower jaw back and move the upper jaw forward. And then the bottom here, we see before and after of this man who has very, very retrusive lower jaw. So we would bring that lower jaw forward with surgery. And then now we also have clear aligners and Invisalign. Um, the way that that works is we scan your teeth and then we send it to the lab. They'll make these uh, trays, these clear trays. The trays have a certain amount of movement programmed in, into them. So with each tray, they'll move your teeth like 0 0.1 millimeters and slowly, slowly, slowly like correct your teeth. And then they also actually, we, we have these little nubs here, the, these circles. So they're little buttons of composite we would put on the teeth. The, those are to help the um, trays grab onto your teeth to make the necessary movements. So that's how Invisalign works. And then now um, I'm going to show you guys some cool cases that I have to just kind of show you the, uh, a variety of things that we do in our office when we are doing braces. So this girl um, came in, she was 15 years old. Her biggest complaint was that her, she couldn't close her lips together and her front teeth were like too flared out. Some people call this like, you know, the horse bite because her upper and lower teeth are just so flared. Um, and if you can see in this x-ray, the side view x-ray, these teeth are just so out there. Um, she doesn't actually have that much crowding, like her teeth are not squished together, but it's just so flared. So we wanted to bring them back and then that would also make her profile better and it will you know, give her more aesthetic outcome. So what we decided to do is we took out teeth. So we took out two teeth on the top. We also took out two in the bottom, but here in this photo, this was after they uh, already closed the lower space. So we used the space to pull those front teeth back and uh, put into a better position. You can already see that her lips are coming together um, and it looks much, much better even at this point. And then this is the final. Um, it took about three years uh, with COVID and everything. So, um, but you can see on the x-ray here, her lower teeth are way in way, way, way better position. Um, her, her lips are fully closed. It just looks so much better. And here's a before and after, or the after is on the left side, but it is such a huge day and night change. So that's really cool. And then here's a surgical case. So as I was talking about, when people have a severe underbite, the only way to fix it is with surgery or with jaw surgery. So here uh, she has, you know, a lot of crowding. And um, so we decided to, you know, take out some teeth on, on the top. And then this is right before surgery. So we made sure that her teeth are in the right position so that when the um, surgeon kind of moves the jaw in the right position, it'll look perfect. So this is right before surgery and after surgery. It's day and night as well. Another thing is you can see this patient kind of has a lot of white spots on her teeth. This kind of happens when patients don't do a good job of cleaning during treatment. They're called white spot lesions. So we really have to like always tell our patients you know, clean really, really, really well. Otherwise you have these permanent white spots on your teeth that, you know, it could go away. There's a chance of it going away in the first two or three months after getting braces off if they do a really good job of cleaning. But if not, then it's just a really unfortunate 
outcome. And she also has this bummed out tooth here that they're, she's going to do crown on. But other than that, you know, it's a, it's a really great, great result. And here's a before and after. It's two different people. And here I have a uh, Invisalign example. So uh, this girl, she is actually missing a lower incisor and lower tooth here. She, um, normally you, would, you should have four, but she only has three. So she's got some like spacing here. And so this is kind of in the middle of Invisalign treatment. As you can see, these little white dots on here. These are the composite attachments I was talking about. It helps the Invisalign trays grab onto the teeth. And we also actually put um, some buttons on the bottom to wear so that she can wear some rubber bands. And the rubber bands help correct the bite. And this is uh, her finish with treatment and everything is nice and like the bite, we wanna see that like really socked in like little gears. So this is very, very socked in bite. So it's improved very, very much. And yeah, so in general for, you know, if I had to give some advice to, to anyone interested in dentistry, the first thing I would say would be to really go and shadow dental offices, like go in there, see what they're doing. And I know that a lot of um, dental schools actually require shadowing. I remember, I think when I applied, like Tufts was one of them who would need, they wanted a certain amount of hours of shadowing, but not just for applying to schools. I think it's also just great for um, your sake to go and see what they do. There's also very, there's different specialties within dentistry. And when I applied to dental school, I didn't necessarily know exactly what all the other specialties were, um, but it'll be good to uh, kind of get your exposure to different areas of dentistry to know if you want to do general dentistry or if you want to go into um, specialties. And another thing is to get involved in research. So I did not have any research experience when I applied to dental school. And I kind of regretted it because um, I just like had no experience. And um, if you wanted to do, if you want to specialize like myself, if you want to do orthodontics, or if you want to do like endodontics or something, a lot of times these residency programs after dental, dental school, they want research experience. Um, but for general dentistry, not so much. But if you want to specialize, then yes. And if you have research experience in college, then it kind of gives you more, ex more exposure to it. It'll make research a little bit easier when you get into dental school and it just has, you have something to add to your resume, which is awesome. That's something that I wish I did more of in college. So I would really recommend doing that. Um, and then, of course, you got to keep your grades up, keep your, you know, get a good DAT score, especially if you want to uh, specialize. Like ortho, orthodontics is a um, very competitive uh, residency. And so grades really do matter, not just in college, but also in dental school. So definitely keep up your study, good, um, good study habits. And uh, one thing I didn't necessarily know when I first applied in L school, but your major doesn't actually matter. Like I was an econ major and a lot of other people in my dental school class were also like, there were other econ majors. There were people who had worked as an architect for, you know, like 10 years and then decided to switch their careers. So the subject doesn't matter, but I do recommend getting some kind of biology background major. Uh, it'll really, really help you in dental school because you're gonna be learning a lot of similar things. For me, I didn't really have much of a biology background, so it was a little more challenging for me in dental school, um, but having a good biology background will definitely help you. And if you wanna do orthodontics, a physics background actually helps as well because there's a lot of physics that goes into how we move teeth with wires, surprisingly. <laughs> And then another thing is take business classes when you have the chance. They say that, you know, one of the biggest things dental schools lack is business classes. And 
Um, most people, when they come out of dental school, when they start a practice, they're doing, they're starting their own practice. So they need these, the business management classes, they need these skills. Um, but we don't necessarily get much exposure to that in dental school. Um, at UCLA, we had like one or two classes that were supposed to be for business management, but they were not um, the most ideal. They were very like surface level. So if you have a chance to take any business management classes, I strongly, strongly recommend it. It'll really help. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I would tell my pre-dental self if I had the chance. And that's all I had for today. Um, I'm open to any and all questions. So yeah, let me know. Thank you, Dr. Ding. Uh, we actually have a few questions that people sent in. Um, so I'm just gonna, the first one in the chat that I see is when it comes to treating and tracking these cases, how are you able to, how are you able to ensure continuity, such as making sure someone doesn't move away, et cetera? So yeah, it's a good question. Um, I generally try to, uh, to prevent people from kind of disappearing from treatment. I would make our appointments um, at, at the end, like we'll make the next appointment for them at the end of that day's appointment so that they'll always have something in the books. And if they miss it, we'll be able to contact them because if we don't put them in the books, it's easy to kind of get, get lost. Um, I believe but there probably are other ways that private offices do it, but this is how UCLA does it in our residency clinic. And when people do move away though, um, they will generally tell us and we would work, we would work it out with um, like, if they are moving to a different state, then um, we either take off the braces for them and then just have them go to a new orthodontist or um, we would fill out kind of like a, there's a special transfer form and we fill that out, give it to the patient. They'll give that to their new orthodontist to continue treatment. Um, so another question that we also had in the chat was how long did it take for you to, how long did it take to do the prerequisites in undergrad? I'm currently a junior in undergrad majoring in psych and I aspire to go into ortho. So it took me two years. I was really lucky that um, I came in, I went to the call into college with a lot of AP credits. So I was still able to get like all my other requirements done, um, even though I started working on the prerequisites really late. Uh, so it took me the full junior year, full sophomore year. And then I took um, one summer quarter to try to finish some other things off. So I'd say like two years, two and a half years. Um, so interesting question that we had was while you were in dental school, um, I know that you said you definitely wanted to go into ortho, or at least you were really interested in it. Were there any other specialties that you kind of saw yourself going into, or were you interested in just as much as ortho? Um, not really, because I went into it just knowing, because orthodontics is actually very different from all the other, all the other, um, specialties. And... It's, it's like, honestly, it's so, so separate from all the other like dental specialties that it's like going to ortho residency is like going to a whole diff whole new kind of area. Um, for a little while, I was considering maybe endo, endodontics. Um, so that's like root canals and things. But then once we actually had the class, I realized that it's not something that I would see myself doing every day. Um, so this is a pretty popular question. Um, they wanted to ask, what are the pros and cons of your school? Or if you don't want to say the cons, maybe like your favorite part. Of, okay, of UCLA. Um, well, I'll just talk about like my residency. My favorite part is uh, we get paid. <laughs> so a lot of residencies actually don't get paid but UCLA is one of the few programs that actually pay us for residency. It's a huge, huge, huge plus. And um, all the faculty are also really approachable here. Like you just, you can, you feel like less like faculty and student is more like colleagues. So it's a really great environment. Cons, I think the building is a little old, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> 
Yeah, when I when I was at the building, I could see like it's definitely not as new as maybe some buildings, but regardless, the program is still great. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the building has changed much since the 60s. Yeah, definitely. Um, so how has the pandemic affected your classes, residency, or just seeing patients in general? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So we stopped seeing patients between around March uh, last year to late July. And then we started, so first of all, we had a we added a bunch of PPE. So I would be wearing an N95 mask and then a surgical mask on top, a uh, face shield. At one point I was wearing a hairnet too, but I don't do that anymore. Um, and then a gown. Um, and we started off with just seeing like two patients a day. So it was like very, it was like less than 50% capacity. Um, we had to figure out scheduling patients. They can't all come at the same time. They had to be staggered. And, um, and then also aerosolizing procedures. So anything that had to do with the hand, a hand piece, like a drill that creates like aerosols, those had to be very, very limited. Um, but now that we are a year into the pandem pandemic, I think um, our clinic has really been able to control it really well. And we've been pretty successful in seeing our patients. So they recently just, um, increase the capacity to 80%. So it's much more busy now, but it's still the same uh, social distancing measures and um, PPE and everything. So yeah, it's getting a little bit more normal, but also it's, it's also affected patients treatment. I had a lot of patients who were transferred to me from previous residents that were about to be done with braces right before pandemic hit. And then when I saw them in July, like things had moved or something, things had happened. So um, a lot of patients had to kind of, their, their treatment became longer because of that. Yeah, I definitely see that. My own brother, he had braces and he was supposed to get them off in March. But mm -hmm. of course, due to everything, like they had to push it back. And by then, like a bunch of teeth had moved. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I think so uh, for all the residents and just all the faculty at the dental school, is everybody vaccinated now at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's vaccinated now. Okay. So and over the pandemic or just over the last few months, have you seen, I know some orthodontists, they've seen an increase in braces or Invisalign because it's like, oh, everybody's saying it's a really good time because you can't see your mouth yeah. and everybody, because everybody, everybody's wearing masks. Did you get like a larger amount of patients because of that or was it about the same? Actually, oh, I, th I forgot to mention this. So because of the pandemic, we actually stopped screening new patients during that time. We only just started screening new patients. But I do think there were a lot of people who were interested in getting treatment. So we had a lot of calls, but we were saying like, oh, we they had to wait because we couldn't screen them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a question that's basically asking about worth work-life balance and I think they're a fan of your Instagram account they're asking how you manage to kind of go through school basically four years of dental school as well as resi residency now while also dancing <laughs> thank you um yeah so it's definitely like a little more difficult now that I'm in residency but usually um I would like dedicate my weekends so maybe one day on the weekend I would uh dedicated to filming content for my social media. And also I got really lucky because first year and then uh, first year in residency was supposed to be the hardest. And I um, actually took a little break from social media last, like last winter. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And then, so I had like, I became really free. So then I started, you know, doing more, more content. Um, but if it weren't for that, I probably would not have been able to like do all of that but usually um I pride myself in kind of managing my time so I would I, I really hate procrastinating so if I had something to do I would try to do all of that finish everything first and like start assignments like weeks early it sounds really nerdy but I started assignments really early to finish it really early so I don't have to think about it and then once you do that you'll realize you actually have a lot of free time and so uh just dedicating like a day or so for these kinds of things like it really it works out yeah totally for sure I know like um 
people who are a fan of your page have definitely seen like an increase in a lot of reels and TikToks. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm doing more of them in clinic now too, because I feel like people are more open to doing reels and TikToks now. So it's like really fun to get, you know, all my coworkers to join in. Um, has anybody ever recognized you while you were in clinic from your social media? Actually, I didn't think so, but actually I had, uh, there was a patient at UCLA who was being treated there already. And then, uh, yeah, one day she, she realized I also worked there. And then she like asked the front desk, like, oh, is Dr. Kathleen here? And then I was like looking really, I like no makeup on everything. <laughs> and then, and then she was like, oh my God, I'm such a big fan of, of your, you know, your dancing and everything. So yeah, I've had that. And then I've also actually had another patient of mine that said she saw me, she, she doesn't have TikTok herself, but her, um, her cousin had TikTok and her cousin saw me and then she saw, she was like, wait, that's my dentist. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty, pretty cool. I feel very honored. So here is a very interesting question. Um, what kind of skills or personality traits do you think you need to enter, um, oh, what kind of skills and personality traits do you think you need to enter into orthodontics? To orthodontics? It's a good question. Um, I think in anything to do with dentistry in general, first of all, you need to be patient. Um, and a lot of, like I said, a lot of ortho, ortho and dentistry is a lot of um, like detailed work. You know, so you have to be very meticulous, patient. Um, and you have to have like good patient management skills because you'll be um, interacting with all kinds of people, all kinds of patients, ranging from younger kids who will like not sit in the chair to like older patients who might have a, be, be pretty demanding. So I think um, it's like a skill that you need to develop. Like you can't be too introverted um, and you have to be kind of a people person. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, so in, a pr in some previous sessions with uh, U former UCLA students or former UCLA orthodontic residents, um, they've mentioned that sometimes faculty can be kind of very straightforward or they'll let you kind of just do your own thing. What was your experience with the faculty in both dental school and your residency now? I haven't had any negative experiences with my faculties um, personally. Uh, I think in, in dental school, it was more like they were more on your back about things like everything you do, they have to check. But in residency, it's a, more independent. And um, like the, you would have faculty come over, they'll, they'll ask what you think, you, you like listen to their advice. And um, it's not like you have to do what they say too. like you can kind of have your own opinion. So that I really appreciate. And I haven't had any faculty have, uh, you know, tell me any, anything too directly in a very, you know, unpleasant way. So um, yeah, may, maybe, maybe I will in the future, but I haven't so far. It's been a good experience. So kind of related to that, I, I'm, so UCLA is a very good program in both dental school and orthodontics. Mm -hmm. um, people are asking, I, and I'm wondering this as well to, um, to be in a class full of like, basically like feeling like, oh, everybody in my class is like really smart and like things like that. Um, how do you motiv motivate yourself to study? And what were some study skills that kind of worked for you in dental school? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so, I think in dental school, uh, I actually had to adjust my study habits a little bit. Um, in college, I would, you know, go to, like, I would have to be in class in order to really, like, absorb everything. And then I learn everything in class so that I learn all the concepts in class so that when I go back home, I don't have to actually study too much. But with dental school, it was so much information at a, in a short amount of time you would go to class and there would be like a 200 slide PowerPoint presentation in like an hour and a half or something. So it was hard to absorb all of that in class. I had to do a lot more studying on my own and then just going over every slide on my own. 
and uh, also biology is like I was used to studying things like physics and chemistry as more concepts focused. Biology is more memorization. So you just have like you either know it or you don't, and you have to like really just sit there and memorize everything. So I think one thing that really helped me was having study groups. So I would go to the library with a couple of friends and then we would study together and then we would come up with like mnemonics together. And then sometimes when you study together, there'll be like funny stories or me memorable moments between you that will help you memorize some concepts as well. So that's a cool tip. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I had to definitely adjust my studying habits. Uh, do you think you studied differently when you were kind of studying econ classes versus your science prereq classes? Definitely. Um, for me, like I said, with econ and things like that, it's more conceptual. So if you get the concept, then you don't really need to study it as much. Like you can just like do some practice problems or something. Uh, but with biology, it's just really this, all this information you just have to cram in your head. So it's a different concept. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, where is it? One of the other questions that we got was, I think you, you kind of answered this before. Um, they're just asking, how do you, basically, how do you become motivated to study and do work? I'm not sure what they mean by do work. I mean, I guess um, to reword the question, like in orthodontic residency, do you have usually more like didactic classes or more so like patient clinic hands-on experience? And how do you kind of deal with the two? Okay, um, it is a, like, we have both. Um, for the first two, I was gonna say like the first year of residency, it's a little more heavier on the didactics, even though we do also have clinic, because um, we also have to take a master's. We have to do a master's at the same time as pursuing orthodontics. So we have to take master's classes as well. Um, nowadays, it's a little bit more of a different experience because everything's on Zoom. I think it makes it easier because you can just like turn on your Zoom anytime, like anywhere. <laughs> but before it was like, I would have to stay at school. Like my first year of residency is our first quarter. I had a 6 a.m. class. And then, so I'd be at school at 6 a.m. And then uh, like nine to 12 is clinic. Then sometimes I have 12 to one is another class. And then two to five is clinic. Like the whole day was just really, really busy. Um, and yeah, so I, now it's like more clinic focused. I'm, I feel like I'm just a clinician now. I go into work and I just like see patients and we have like one or two classes here and there. And then the classes that we do have, it's more like, it's not like the traditional lecture where we sit and someone's lecturing. It's a seminar and we would present a patient case and then everybody puts their heads together to talk about what they would do in this case, how they would treatment plan. So it's uh, different from the traditional sense of like studying and going to class. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think people kind of think that like since dental school, like people are always talking about like first and second year, like the did didactic courses are super hard and you're just like, like you said, cramming like 200 page slides into your head. Yeah, yeah. Dental school um, was, there was a bigger um, discrepancy. So like first and second year was mostly classes. You'd rarely go into clinic at all. Third and fourth year is like all clinic almost. So that, that was a big, big change. So in terms, um, since you stayed at the same school for residency, um, same school for residency and dental school, mm -hmm. um, for those wondering, for those who aren't pre-dental, but in dental school right now, but are interested in ortho, they're wondering what can they kind of do? Like, for example, if they were like you, like um, they 100% like want to go into orthodontics, the uh -huh. first thing they, they do to, when they step into dental school the first day, what should they do? Or like, who should they talk to? So um, I think the first thing you should do is definitely keep up your grades. Ortho is a really competitive, I think ortho and oral surgery are the two like most competitive specialties. Uh, most likely you're gonna find a lot of people in a class that probably wanna do ortho too. So uh, keeping up with your grades, super important. And then also find a lab to do, to, to do research. 
And it doesn't have to be like ortho related research. It can be any research, as long as you have research experience because they really like to, or um, schools really like to see that. Yeah. Um, I think like, like you said, like orthodontics is a very popular residency to the point where I think someone this cycle, they said they had an interview question that should have asked them, tell me reasons why you wouldn't want to be an orthodontist or they oh, wow. would be like oh you don't want to be an orthodontist right and they would have to answer that like <laughs> oh interesting yeah I mean, <laughs> that's a really interesting question yeah um and in, in terms of ortho residents I was gonna ask something but I forgot um <laughs> in in terms of uh what is it so I know UCLA is on a pass-fail grading system in dental school, right? Yes. Uh, so how did you kind of, for um, people who, who may be uh, UCLA students who are matriculating into UCLA right now, or for other pass-fail schools, how do you kind of differenti differentiate yourself in terms of grades? Uh, so UCLA is pass-fail, but we also have honors. And this, <laughs> this little difference, it, it makes a huge, like, it actually impacts a lot because... Uh, at first, when I got into UCLA, I was like, hey, it's pass fail honors, you know, it's still pass fail it should be like, not that bad. But actually, it makes it a little bit more stressful, because uh, to differentiate yourself, you would have to get those honors. And honors is like, the, what the top 10% or something. So it's basically the, the grading scale is an A, and then a C and then an F. <laughs> so it's like, you're either an A or a C. Um, yeah, so then you have to kind of work harder and try to get as many honors as possible. Yeah, I've seen um, schools say that they're like, oh, if you basically don't get honors, they're going to assume like you passed with like a 76 or something. Or yeah, something. there's like very difficult that you can't really distinguish between the, the A minuses and the Cs. <laughs> So one of the last questions that we always like to ask um, our guests on this session is if you could kind of travel back like seven years or so um, to when you were a pre-dental or when you were first entering dental school, what would you want to tell yourself? Hmm. Um, I think I'd like some of the things that I, that I mentioned in the advice area. So number one is take more business classes. And number two, I wish I took some more, like I wish I did a science related major. Like I know that even from, even though for me it was more because I was forced to just stick with my econ major because I didn't have any time to pick up another major. Um, I found myself really struggling. So first of all, when I was taking a DAT, I pretty much self-taught, like self-learned biology, the biology section. When I first started learning a DAT, I didn't even know what an, what like the Golgi apparatus was. Like I didn't know anything. So uh, if I were to have more of a biology background, it would have really helped me in a lot of the science classes in dental school as well. I just felt like I was always like, like a little bit behind everyone and I had to put in more effort to get to where everyone else was. So that's probably the biggest thing. Um, yeah, and it's pretty much what I had in the pre-dental advice section. Okay, uh, I think with that, that is the end of today's session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ding, for sitting down with us. You're and giving welcome. Us the and then I have also my um, social media and my email. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I will do my best to help you guys. Yeah, if you're not following Dr. Ding on Instagram yet, please go do so. There's some great dance and <laughs> content on there. Yes, learn about dentistry through my accounts. <laughs> Uh, for everybody else watching this session, I sent the short quiz link into the um, into the chat as well as pasted it in the description. So just refresh if you can't see it. And I just opened up the quiz. So yeah, thank you so much, doctor. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. All right. Okay. I